Inc. Speaker Series for 2021. My name is Russell Mason, Vice President of ASPE and host for tonight. And as per usual, I'd like to ask everyone to kindly check your devices, make sure they're set to mute so we can avoid any background noises during the presentation. And also, if we have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat function. And our moderator and hardworking committee member, Adrian Weir, will be posing the question as we go. Well, tonight we'll be hearing from Melbourne-based Kimberly Wallace, aka Kim Boyd. Kim's work has been exhibited in many countries, including the US, France, Ireland and Russia, winning numerous awards for her work, including the Mono Awards, where she was a finalist runner-up in the photo of the year 2019 and first place in the IPA Awards, to name a few. So tonight, Kim will be presenting a talk titled The Constraint of Persistence, where she'll be telling us how she goes about working with constraints in relation to her photo project. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming and uh, asking me to speak tonight. You've had some fabulous speakers in the series and I'm looking forward to the future ones. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk through uh, the constraint of persistence, um, which is uh, taking a look at the commuter series photos that I've been working on for, I think it's about nine years now. It might be a bit longer, but I know it's at least nine. Um, and I'm going to talk through how that project came about and with the constraints that I had placed on that project, um, how it helped me develop and I mean, I'll talk through some of the te techniques that I've, I've used to develop my work. And the lessons that I've learned from that uh, series has really affected my future work. And the, there's a series that I'm working on at the moment that I've, I've photographed um, between December and June and July this year that I'm trying to work out what I'm going to do with. So I'm going to share some of the photos from that as well. So um, I thought, first of all, uh, I would show you some of my um, other photos to prove that I do take pictures other than um, <laughs> commuters and trains and I'm not just the crazy train lady. Um, can you guys see my screen okay I just before I continue? Yeah, perfect, Kim. Cool. Um, okay, so I'll tell you a bit about, about my background while I do because I show these photos. These sort of show off my rambling nature that's normally um, when I'm not working on a dedicated project, I sort of photograph everything under the sun. Um, but I grew up in Queensland. Um, I was really lucky that I had a father that was into photography. And when I was a teenager, he taught me how to use a 35 millimeter film, uh, film camera and also a dark room. And I'll never forget you know, developing my first print in the dark room. I can still smell the chemicals. And I know it's science, but it feels like a bit of magic when you do it for the first time. Um, and so when I finished high school, uh, much to my mother's horror, I chose to study photography rather than the career that I was sort of being predestined to take, um, which was in music. Um, and I just, it just felt really natural to me to select photography. So I studied for a couple of years um, and it was amazing and I had some amazing teachers and other students around me. But when I finished that, I was kind of like, well, now what? Like, I was so young at the time. I had no idea what I really wanted to do. And then a year later, a friend of mine said to me, hey, I'm going to move to Melbourne. You want to come? And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally in. So I moved from a town called Toowoomba, just west of Brisbane, down to Melbourne with him and uh, tried to work out what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I sort of worked various jobs. I worked for a couple of photographers at the time, uh, different times in sort of different areas and just sort of see if that suited me. And I hated it and I hated it to a point where I put down my camera and I shoved it in a cupboard and <laughs> didn't look at it for a long time. Um, fast forward you know, about a decade later um, and one midlife crisis later, um, you, I realised that I really was desperately missing the creativity and I needed to make a conscious choice to bring that back in my life. So I started playing music again, I started painting and then I picked up my camera and started shooting and I realised, what am I doing? I need to be taking photos. Um, photography is really like a therapy for me. It's um, a very zen-like moment and I, I really needed to make sure I was doing it. Um, so I made the conscious choice to 
decide that I was going to do a project because I knew if I didn't, I'd just keep taking rambling images of various things. Um, but when I went to pick a project, I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to photograph. Um, I just knew I had all these constraints on my life. You know, I work full time. I've got a pretty high stress job at times and can work really long hours and I have three children. So trying to work around those things is really, really difficult. So um, I had to sit down and actually really think about what it is that I want out of the project and uh, how I was going to make that work with my life. Um, and I really just wanted to practice and um, be able to produce a solid body of work, um, whatever that form it came in. Uh, so I sat down and went, right, well, the only time that I can actually get photos in without having bad mother guilt because I've done something <laughs> that, you know, had to sacrifice some time with my kids was on the way to, way to work and way home and literally on the way like I couldn't go somewhere for an hour take photos and then go home I, it needed to be on the way um so there was the walk to the train station the trains that I take on the walk from the that train station into my office so it seemed pretty obvious to me that it had to be trains uh which to be honest wasn't a hard sell I've always had a bit of a love for trains I think that's because I grew up in a town that didn't have such things um so I knew that it was going to be trains and I also knew that I had to put some, um, work out some other constraints around it. So it was the editing, which was the second part um, that was really, really important so that I could get that feedback as, as quick as possible so I could work out what, um, what I liked and what I didn't like, basically. So I've got a selection of photos that I'm going to show tonight and I've sort of grouped them together, not because they're a series in this manner at all, it, but this is the way that I look at my work as a whole to, to try and create a, a strength in various areas. So these are grouped together based on a physical structure and these ones are called um, Inside Out and that is just simply because they are taken inside a train um, looking out one of the, the train windows. And this is kind of where I started. Um, when I took the first photo through that window, I realised um, how comfortable it felt, but also um, there was lots of promise. So I've, I've got quite a lot of these photos over the years, as you can imagine. Um, I don't do a, a lot of them now, um, not really by any sort of conscious choice just because of things I'm looking for at the moment are harder to get in these windows. Um, and I probably should start with saying that all of these photos, all of my commuter photos are all taken with a mobile phone. Um, and again, that was a conscious choice to do that. I didn't want to be lugging equipment every day um, to work because part of this project had to be about shooting every day and fitting it into my every, every day um, as much as I possibly can. Um, so my mobile I had with me, it was user friendly. It took decent photos. I hadn't really used it seriously before and, um, use this as an opportunity to, to learn it as a tool and see how far you can push, um, the images that you get, get from it. Uh, so I started taking these photos and I found the windows as a really, um, playful space. And I think I found it comfortable because I thought, well, no matter whatever happens with this stuff, no matter how what photos I get, um, they will be tied together by this window and what I see in the window every day. And I try to use lots of um, different things to do that. And graffiti is one that I absolutely love. And this is the graffiti on the, the, the train window itself. You don't get them these days. Unfortunately, Metro put this graffiti, anti-graffiti stuff on the window. So you really need to find an old rattler um, that the kids have gotten to. And I just love the effect that it gives. Um, it kind of takes this particular photo I love because, you know, commuters are seen as this very um, blob-like substance. You know, people, there's a group of people that go every day to work and back. There's no names. There's no no actual definition as to who those people are. And that's what I see in this image, um, you know, hidden behind the graffiti of the train window. There's all these people just, just trying to survive, basically. 
So I like to push the images and I try to really push the colour and um, contrast. And I liked using people in the trains as shadows to give another layer of depth. The people that always are in the in the front of the window, I always, um, they're naturally in shadow anyway, but um, I always shadow them out completely. Metro um, used to, I don't know if they still do, had this rule about taking photos inside trains and as much as I do still take photos inside trains. Um, I was, I was being pretty careful. This is all a bit scary for me. Um, this photo I like because you can see here how with the mobile, as you push it with movement, because the, these photos are taken when the train is either coming into a platform or going out of a platform, you can see how by pushing the contrast, you can get this really strange sort of drawing kind of painting look. And it started to make the photos more surreal to me where I was trying to capture sort of what happens on a platform more than more than anything and I tried to play with the the backgrounds in terms of the sky being white rather than blue because it just sort of made it that extra sort of step away from um the actual true life real scenario that was going on but my work's changed and it goes you know from one extreme to the other and you start to see some of these little moments and and capture them you know with an arrow that uh is actually on the train window itself but the girl just happened to be uh, at the same time we just managed to time it um the mobiles are great because they don't sort of force you it sort of forces you to focus on other things rather than the technical aspect i just allow the mobile to do whatever it wants to do good or bad and then I just deal with it um, because the whole one of the one of the things that I do when I learn is that I really break things down to a, a smaller level and and this was about composition this was about trying to find a placement um, a simplicity to an image um, so it sort of took that stress away because you know in these situations you can't adjust like you know a street photography is gone in an instant and you know these certainly happen really quickly so you don't have much time and you certainly can't adjust you know exposure and stuff on the fly you just got to go with it so um this was much more about just capturing those moments capturing uh the people and and trying to find a way f for me to have a artistic release in a lot of ways um these last two photos in the inside are, are, are on very, very cold, rainy, wet mon uh, mornings uh, on the trains, and you could get some. You can get some fantastic things with the the rain as it hits the window. I love this photo. It's um, I know it's not one of my strongest images by far, but it's one that I that really talks to me, and that's because the girl sort of looks like she's melting from the rain. Um, and the condensation that was on the window at the time. Um, so she kind of looks like a witch or a sort of a ghost or some sort of, uh, you know, apparition. Um, and for me, it sort of really reminds me of like, you know, becoming an adult and trying to work out who you are, which was essentially what I was trying to do with this project, was really find me in all of this mess that is photography and stuff. So, Kim, how did you have other commuters that were on the train with you? Did they yeah. react to you? No, none. And I think that's really also the power of using a mobile. Everyone's got a mobile and everyone's looking at their mobile. Um, so no one ever, I've never been asked and I've never been, and I don't think people actually ever notice that I'm taking photos. But it's, I think it's also because of the way that I take my photos. I don't actually hold the camera up to my face or very rarely do um, for those particular types of photos. And in these other ones, um, I, I talk about that a little bit more in my flexion work, but I because I'm not holding up, it's not really obvious. So people go around their day to day. In fact, I took my, I did take my um, Olympus out one morning to work to see if I could do the photos on it, and no, <laughs> completely different reaction. So I, I think it's the just the quietness of what the mobile is because everyone's got one. And how did you get such empty trains? The trains I go on have got sardines. <laughs> Well, that's the advantage of living at the end of the train line. Um, <laughs> I'm the first one on, so I always get a seat in the morning and I get to watch it fill up and it fills up pretty quick though. So there is only a couple of stations I can photograph on the way in uh, into the city before it's just too full and you can't get 
get the images. Yeah, cool. Thank you. No worries. Um, so I'm going to talk about these doorways now. And again, this is another way I've sort of grouped my photos for comparison. Um, and it's just another structural frame to use basically in the image. Um, and it kind of like the window, I know that, you know, my doorway photos, they do tie in together in a way as, as a baseline. And then I can, I can play from there. So Kim, and, just before we start that, we've got a question from Dan and Khan. What sure. phone were you using and what app did you use to take the photos? So I just use the native camera app that's on the phone and I use an Android. I use Samsung. Um, I don't, I've got a 21 now, but I did not have a 21 when I started. I think I started with an S5. So yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, so the doorways photos are, have a different feel again. Um, I don't know what it is about it. The different structures, I kind of start to see different things. And, uh, and also cause you know, my style's changing as I'm trying to experiment. Um, so these are just a little bit more realistic um, and I use a lot of um, shadows in these photos um, and they're a little bit less distorted. I still have photos where in, in this series where, you know, there is this kind of like painterly kind of feeling, but it's less so. Um, and this was kind of where the doorways was kind of where I realised that... Um, there's a lot more to this project than I thought than practice. Um, this is one of the images that I caught that I really, that changed that for me, where I realised I'm in a conversation with a commuter every day um, and it is about the people that travel. Um, and so I really tried to focus on that um, more as I shot further and further because you know with a doorway it's when you take photos of this you're obviously a lot closer um i don't zoom with my mobile at all i just take the the it as it is basically um so you are a lot closer so you and you're the the person in the photo is a lot larger um and this girl i saw it and i was like gee she's a bit like mona lisa she reminds me of that um sense of you want to understand what that person is thinking, but you have absolutely no idea and you could never guess what it is. And I really like that. Um, and the expressions became something that I really particularly tried to sort out um, and then try to use the the train and the, the doorway as a way of sort of enhancing that voice uh, of the commuter. Um, you know, the trains really are a social equaliser and I, I, I started calling my project Mirror Mirror, although, to be honest, I shouldn't really even be calling a project anymore. It's it's a total obsession. I've been doing it for nine years and it's never going to stop. So it's it's probably more of a theme now than a project. Um, but the uh, it is a social equaliser. Like you have people on a train in the morning who are earning, you know, $250,000 a year and $10,000 a year. You have people from every cultural background um, speaking multiple languages. You know, every kind of difference you can imagine is on a train. And the, the decisions that we make as a society and government all change that face on a day-to-day -day basis and you see a lot of, of expressions and you can relate to, relate to them and I certainly relate to all of these images and see something in it um, within my own head as like a com because it is for me like a conversation with showing what's happening um, and and we're a pretty the house that I have is a pretty news filled house and we're very um, politically aware and follow politics pretty carefully and I watch, read, read a lot of news. And and so is this kind of my therapy in a way? It's kind of about screaming out to, to people about this is what we're this is what we're creating um, people. This is this is what we've chosen. This is this is what it looks like. Is that what we want? Um, you know, and that's the power of photography and particular street photography. Um, the, the thing I love about this about it is that it is photographing or capturing a moment that's lost in an instant and nobody sees it. And you have the power of displaying an image and, and someone having the opportunity to see it through your eyes and seeing um, something beautiful. 
and ugly as well at the same time. Um, but ge but getting that reaction from the viewer. This one I like, but it's going to get lost in the history of time, I think, because I took this photo during the Victorian bushfires um, before the pandemic and no one was wearing masks, but people started wearing them on the trains because, you know, you, I'm sure you all remember what some of the days were like in terms of air quality. And I remember seeing this image and thinking, wow, this is, you know, climate change is real people and look what we're having to do. Like this is getting kind of crazy. Um, I also play with the the shadows and the, the doorways. I really like using some of the shapes that you get from the light in the st train stations, um, which change changes all through the year. Um, but really trying to focus down on what uh, a person is. And I love this guy. Um, he looks like he's had the day that I usually have. <laughs> so I can really relate to, to what's going on with him. Um, and then you sort of get, you know, different types of trains as well. And then the yellow stripes and, and getting him used to colour has is, is been pretty difficult for me. Um, I My first love is always black and white, um, probably because my baby photos are in colour. Well, that's what people tell me. But um I find it difficult to work with colour in a way that satisfies me. And this was about satisfaction, about um, being able to find someone on a train who has an expression that I can, you know, relate to, that the lighting surrounding them enhances their voice, um, angular, being okay with deep shadows um, and using them to your advantage as much as you possibly can. Um, with my editing, I don't use multi-composites or anything. The only things I use are burning and dodging and con selective contrast and saturation changes um, uh, and cropping. That's it. I don't. I try to work with the image that's already been captured rather than adding multiple layers in. Um, and I do get questioned about um, the multiple layers uh, and multiple exposures. And usually it's because of this reflections work. And this was, um, I started doing these uh, and they were, it was kind of a revelation when I hit this point. So when you take photographs of the same thing every single day, um, the people change, the light changes, but essentially there's limited, there's limited things you can use to try and capture them. And I have, a got a sort of selection of what I use, which I'm showing you tonight, but it gets really boring. Like it gets really frustrating. It's kind of like, you know, how many times can you take the same picture but get a different picture? Um, and so I was always really striving for the next thing. And I get to the point where I'd be absolutely so frustrated and thinking, that's it, I'm done. I can't stretch this subject matter any further. And then you take another image and you get something completely different. And it's like this whole rabbit hole has become available to you to jump down. And it's so exciting. So these are reflections. Um, I remember this photograph. I remember the day. And um, I went to the tra train station. I was waiting for my train. And I looked down the train as a, well, it was a train passing by. It wasn't stopping. It was just running straight through. And I watched it go past. And I could see this perfect reflection of every single person on the platform in the windows. And it was a crystal, it was a crystal clear day. And I'm like, okay, let's see if we can get that. Well, I don't know. And I had seen this girl, she had, was standing on the opposite side of me. I thought, okay, well, let's, let's give it a go. Um, and so when the train, next train pulled in, I fired off some shots and I found this and I'm like, okay, let's, this is interesting. What else can I do with it? So it led me down this hole of um, trying to find as many reflections and it's, this can be really difficult because you really need the light in a right spot to be able to to get them. Um, you can't, I couldn't, there'd be days and days where I, I really wanted one of these, but no, that wasn't going to happen on those days. So with these photos, I try to play with the the light in a different way. It's, same, it's kind of similar with what I do with the doorways. Like, you know, my photography is a I call pretty minimal because I'm really only trying to focus on one voice all the time. Within there's lots of things happening in a photo. My brain just doesn't, I, I can't do it yet. <laughs> I 
I'm working my way there. So um, I try to focus down on that one person and, and where the light is hitting them and, and tell tell their story. And you get these um, also amazing things happening with reflections. You know, you get images from people from within the train, you get views through the train to the other platforms, you get reflections of things going on behind you, around you. And it's sort of like, uh, it sort of becomes that dream within a dream thing where there's like trying to work out in your head when you look at it, which bit is which. And then you kind of get to the point where, well, I do with them where I'm like, I don't care, I just, I think it works. <laughs> um, I always, again, this is another example of where I've like tried to focus on to back onto one person. And I really do like this lady here who's, um, you know, got a book, but she's pretty interested in the in the girl who's um, probably just wants to be home. Um, but it, they do, some of my photos I compare to Grimm's fairy tales. Um, and, and I think that, or, the fact that I focus on one person kind of um, alludes to that. This is a, um, a photo that's it's been published several times, but um, I like this because of the reflections that are going on as well in it um, and, and the layers. It feels a bit like the book's kind of coming to life or what that, that girl is, is thinking about. Um, a lot of my images are quite dark um, and... I just have always taken small dark photos. Uh, anyone who went to college with me can tell you that if they found a dark print in in the wash bay, that was guaranteed to be mine. Um, this photo is called No One, uh, and this is well, probably one of my more recent works. And this is something that um, I do adore. It's in the Women's Street Photographer Book, um, which I just can't believe it's in there to be honest, but. Um, it's such an amazing book. Um, but what I love about this photo is it is starting to pull together all the lessons that I've learned um, in terms of layering shadows um, and, the, and having a singular figure. Um, and it reminds me of the, you know, we have never been more connected but disconnected at the same time. You know, we have all this technology at our fingertips, but yet a lot of us are really starting to, to struggle from being isolated and that was true before the pandemic happened and has probably been just been amplified you know particularly over the last 18 months and this was taken before that and all I could see in this girl was you know um a f female of of loneliness that you know we have all these tools but yet she, you know she's standing there looking like she's uh thinking about something that's not great to be honest so I do like the way that, um, for me, I feel like the story is starting to be able to be, I'm able to create images that tell that story. Um, and I, I try to take the lessons from all of my imagery into the next image, no matter what that is, whether it is a commuter photo or something else. Um, and this one I love because of the, the sideways rain. It was one of those days in Melbourne where, you know, you go one metre and it's sunny and bright and a metre and a half away, it's um, <laughs> pouring. <laughs> uh, and this is light sideways rain. So I really like the graphic nature that it created in this photo and I really tried to enhance that um, when I was editing. Um, and this is a self-portrait I did a few years ago. Um, there's uh, a few reasons why I love this photo. Um, and it's because um, it, it's, well, I took it because when I first turned up to this platform to go home, um, I don't know, I think I must have left work that day early, but I got to the platform and there was no one there. And it was infuriating because the light was fantastic that day. So I'm like, well, all right, photos of me it is because, you know, the other thing too is when I'm working out which photos are that I'm prepared to edit or publish or show anybody, I'm only prepared to do it if uh, if I considered myself in the subject. If I was that subject and that photo got out of me, would I be comfortable with it? If the answer is yes, then go for it. So I like to try and make sure that I've put myself in the, own, the, the same situation as my subjects. But what I love about this is it shows me doing what I love in my complete Zen moment because it's 
Um, photographing for me is about music on completely no thinking, no worries, just shooting and creating. Um, but this actually shows exactly how I do it. Um, and the next couple, the next photo as well, will show you also another example of how I do it. So I knew the train was coming. I knew where I needed to put the phone and I didn't look when I took any of the photos um, that day. Um, so you can see that I'm holding it to the side. Um, I sometimes do look at the, my mobile when I shoot and you can see that in this one. You can see that I'm looking at it. But the only thing I can see is a train whizzing past. So I'm looking, the only thing I'm looking for is to check if the window's in the frame because you don't have, um, especially initially, you can't tell what you're photographing. I kind of have a bit of an idea now just because I've had so much practice. I know how things are going to react and I, I know I, I shoot at the same platforms every day. I sh shoot at the same train, st train stations every day. So I kind of know them pretty, pretty well by now. Um, so I'm just looking for that window um, and making sure that it's in there. And I love that because it means I don't know what I've got. And then you have that really great moment of, you know, when you used to go and pick up the, um, your prints at the chemist because you'd had them developed, it kind of feels like that. It's like, oh, wow, oh, that's terrible. Throw that one away. And I know it's like the timing is a bit relative and it's a lot quicker now, but um I, I do like the fact that I have no control over the moment and, and street photography is about having no control but yet still managing to get something that people want to stop and, and pause at. Um, the light in Melbourne is great. Um, you, you can actually see, if you look at my whole entire catalogue, which I don't think I've probably even done. Um, you can actually tell which seasons are which and you can see like a year's worth of, of light. There are certain times of the year when the light is just magnificent and you know you're going to get colours and all these fantastic things and then you also know that there's going to be days when it's going to be a bit of a struggle, uh, particularly for these reflection shots. Um, you know, autumn is the best love autumn on on the trains i can't wait to be on a train in autumn again for the for the reflections um and this is this is one of those photos where i'm talking is have a bit of a grim's fairy tale look um and it's for me it's the clouds that are in this photo that does that uh and and color uh so i really like this image because it's it, it is so simple there is very little elements in this photo but it it just all seems to work well together um, and then there's this magnificent lady, which I'm only showing because I think she's magnificent. And I really hope one day I am looking that glamorous at a train station. But I love the way that a cut of her coat is sort of the lines are replicated in um, the, the escalator uh, that's behind her. So the kind of last ones I want to show you are windows I know it's such an inventive name um <laughs> but these are windows where it's um you're standing on the platform uh taking the photo uh so you're not in the train but you're outside the train and and you're literally trying to get someone uh a commuter within the window so within the train itself so not a reflection but have them as the the hero of the story or or the um the protagonist um, oh, sorry about that. So I use I use windows to explore that those lines and and strength and trying to get that that composition that sort of anchors. I I'm pretty obsessed by composition to be honest um, because I learned pretty quickly that you can't make a badly composed photo good. <laughs> well, I never could anyway. So. I always try to make sure that the, the composition of the photo has a strength to it that you might miss, the expression might just not be right or the gesture, but um, at least you have a strength in, in those core elements. And again, you're thinking about layering. Um, really love using shadows for layers, like it's totally underrated. Um, I, you know, where if you if you haven't used them a lot, I suggest you do, because um, it really does kind of make um, a more two D object more look more three D. And trains are really flat 
they you know they're not there's a there is a window and that's it and this is a good example where i the the that layering of shadows works you know there is someone on the shadow who's actually on the platform there's the reflect that ref, the reflection of that person there's someone on the train that you've got um the shadow of i think there's actually a shadow of someone who's on the other side of the station on the other platform and then you've got the shadows from the escalator so it, it gets a bit messy with your mind but although there's all these shadows on it it's still about the the person on on the right and and their expression and what they're doing and how they how they look um, and you can get these graphicness as well. So the, I, I've kind of tried to try out all the variations that I feel work in terms of straight black and white through to some colour to some more extreme colour um, and, and using colour in a way that I feel respectful to the story that I'm trying to tell. This one was the runner up in the Mono Awards. Um, this again was one of those times when I saw something new that I hadn't really seen before. And it was this shaft of light that just came through one day on a station that I'm sure has, had been there many times, but I just never saw it and never captured it. Um, and I love the way the fact that there's the, also the shadow on the train itself. Um, so you've got this other triangular sort of bend and that's more because the train was a bit mis misshapen because, um, you know, trains always in perfect nick. Um, so that's always an exciting moment. But, but now you kind of get more the white trains and the white trains have a window that is a really weird size. It's really... The, the proportions of it feel really strange in a photo so that was a challenge trying to get something that worked with that and I found shadows with my my friend in that and cutting off off the picture um so there's lots of lines going in this photo but for me I feel like I always go back to the person so again it's that it's that composition technique that I was trying to really replicate and the constraints of this a whole project was the replication of a process which was shoot edit as soon as possible and i would shoot at a couple of stations and then edit on the way to work um and then there was one last train that i i got and i would um take more photos then i'd, I'd edit them actually in my lunch hour and then on the way home i would shoot and then edit for the rest of my journey now i have a pretty decently length journey so that gave me enough time to do that um but it, it made me aware of what I was doing a lot faster. I find that if I shoot with a larger camera and then I've got to download all the photos and then I get time to edit them, I I lose a bit of that because I, it's a bit more disconnected from the moment just because of the length of time. Um, this is one of the blue trains and the first blue trains I brought out kind of got a bit scuffy pretty quick, which I loved because it gave this great texture across um, the train, which was something else to play with and something new. Uh, and then they brought out advertising. My goodness. Um, I don't know who decided at Metro to allow advertising on the outside of the trains. I'm sure they've made lots of money from it, but from a photographer's point of view, very inconvenient. Um, it's difficult to work with, and I have only this is the only real photo that I've I'm truly happy with that has worked with advertising, um, because you do have this mix of what's happening in the advertising and then the person itself. I love this because it's an ad about food, and there is a lady with a hand on her head, and it's like, really, we're talking to women about food in this way again, really? This is where we're here? Like, again, seriously? <laughs> so for me, I actually find it kind of funny, this photo. Um, but, yeah, advertising is a tough one to work with. It really is. Um, and but the, so the old rattlers will always be my favorite, I must admit. Um, but I've tried to take the old rattlers now and apply some of the techniques I've had to use with the more colorful trains back onto them. And this one, actually, there's very little editing I've done with this photo. It came out like this. The um, one of the stations that I photograph at, at has this light that just appears every now and then where you get, can get a shaft of light into the actual train itself but you still get this really harsh uh, shadow on the outside um, and this one just screams to me of youth I think it's probably because she looks like um, Ariana Grande that's one singer I think that's how you say her name so I'm not really up with the cool kids these days um, 
but it just it just screams of the youth and the way that they want to be famous and it's all about the spotlight with them but then you kind of have the other extreme where you now can get images without faces um and you can get you know beautiful clothing that um the folds replicate the lines in in the trains itself so this is how it was i think uh taking these photos has really sucked me into an obsession because of these little things that always um come to me as a surprise and 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 delight to be honest it's always it's always so much fun when i find something new because it just reinvigorates my my love of taking commuters and this one i love because you can't see her eyes and it's so striking in terms of the lines but it tells a story without actually seeing this lady's face in um, at all. Uh, it, it tells a story. It also, you can't really, there's, you wouldn't necessarily know this is a train um, straight up either. So I like that about it. And that's really kind of using those, that negative space, the shadows, whatever you want to call it, um, to, to my advantage. And I use them more and more the you know I, I haven't been able to shoot on trains for I think it's 546 days or something um I've taken one train since then I tried to shoot it was it was it didn't go well um but uh because I'm not traveling into my work I'm I'm really missing them and but looking back at these photos and my collection as a whole has really made me excited about going back because I don't know how the pandemic and mask wearing is going to affect what I can create because it's been focused so much on on people and their expressions. Um, you know, this has got some lovely clouds in the background, but yet the guys and the guy seems to be thinking. Um, so it, you, you can get some more playful stuff, even though my photos tend to be dark a lot of the time. Um, and this is the last train photo I'm going to show. Um, this photo for me culminates in all of my lessons that I've learned in the project. And this is not by means I think is necessarily my best photo, um, but I love it. And as soon as I took it, I knew, I saw I saw the moment happen. I saw I, as it went past my eyes, because, you know, you really have to train yourself to see it in your through your own eyes before you even put a camera to it. Rather than needing the camera to frame it to be able to see it, you've got to be able to see it on the fly because those, those moments are gone in a, in a heartbeat. Um, and I kind of, if the way I think about it is, um, you know, when I started, it was like, you know, when you go to those big train stations and they say, you're on, you know, platform three or whatever, and then the announcement comes over and says, your train's now going to depart from platform five and you have to trudge up these massive stairs and back down again to another platform. And when I first starting train taking these photos, I really was that person who'd trudge up and go to the other platform and wait. And then, you know, of course they'd announce, oh no, sorry, sending it back to your original platform. And then I have to go all the way back. Now it feels like I go halfway. They move my platform, I move, I walk halfway because I know that something new is going to happen and something is going to change straight away. So I feel like I'm ready for the next bit of change and and we'll work out how to adapt or um and change the way i shoot so um i think that's a lesson that when you photograph any subject as you become more intimate with it um and it's not about getting a great shot it's about telling a story or telling the story about the person and in it or the architecture that you're photographing or the shadows whatever it is um the more you get to know that, the better the better a job that you can do because it's a com conversation. So that's so, my trip. So while you finish the trains there, um, I've got a few questions. So how about we do those and then we'll move on to what yep. you've got next for us. So um, sure. Ananda asks, it's quite a long one here, so bear with us. What do you look for in the? Oops, sorry, the, my screen just moved as people typed in. What do you look for in the abstraction of tone, color, and once you choose a visual cosmetic, are you ever tempted to drift from it or to change it? Do you use yeah. more than one visual look in a project? Um, yeah, I think 
Well, I don't know. Um, it's a really good question. I don't, when it comes to the, the colour choice or saturation or tone of the image, um, I don't consciously make that choice. I assess it based on the photograph in front of me. Now, I know that is there's unconscious bias in that, right, because it'll depend on my mood that day. <laughs> it'll depend on if it's the morning or the afternoon. Um, but it's it's not something I, I purposely pick and I per don't purposely pick to make a particular photo a certain way. And to be quite honest, I have a really hard time making a series. So actually narrowing down photos and working out what works well together because I don't feel like I am, I ever make anything that is enough alike to really sort of tie it together um, as tight knit as I would like to. Um, so I think with photography for me it's about what the photo I've taken I think is trying to express so how do I connect with it and then being able to reflect that if the with the coloring um and the mood um and tone so I hope yeah. that answers your question thank you and um I think you've answered this one but um Emma asks are you always shooting at the same couple of stations you get such amazing different shadows and thank think you yes um I do um, there is two close to home to me and there's one in the city that I photograph photograph at. Um, Constantly is my favourite station, um, is North Melbourne, if anybody wants to know. Um, it's the most fantastic station for light. It really is. They it, And it changes all day just because of the, the, the architecture of it um, and where it's, where it's placed. So um, it's not great when it's raining, though. Uh, you tend to get wet at that station. Um, but, yeah, that, that's where all of these shafts of light photos come from um, and all the reflection work. So any of the ones where you see the escalator in the background, that's all North Melbourne yeah. Station. And, and Renata asked, and I'm going to sort of add a second part to this one, Renata asked, how long would you spend at a station at any one time? And I'm going to add, have you ever chosen to not get on your train because it's so good? <laughs> That's your next one to stay there. Oh, do I really need to answer that one? Okay. Um, so I actually don't stay at the stations long. So when, so the ones that are taken at sort of the start of my journey, of course, I'm on the train. So you literally have the minutes um, that they're going. So it'll be, I usually start shooting probably about 50 metres from a station as it pulls in um, and only about 20 as it pulls out. The train gets to a certain speed where the, the a mobile phone just can't handle it. It freaks out. So you've only got a short space. At the station at North Melbourne, um, I get off one train, go to the, the City Loop trains and it's the, the moment when those trains pull in um, that I get these photos and I just get on the train. The reflection photos are when a train's pulling in at North Melbourne Station and I just um, shoot that train and then back in. So I don't actually shoot that many trains normally on a day. You know, it's like, well, it'll be six by the time I get home. But, um, but it's just that one train coming in. Have I ever missed a train because I want to take more photo? Yes. <laughs> I have done that. I have been laid home um, a couple of times. Not many, though, like, to be honest. I have so much to do when I get home. I can't really af afford yeah. to be out taking trains. But, yeah, I have missed trains. Um, it's more on the uh, mornings. If I'm going to do that, it's, if, it's usually on the mornings on the way to work um, because sometimes uh, in winter at North Melbourne Station, early in the morning, you again, you get this fabulous light. So I have waited for a couple of city loops and taken more photos just because I was having fun and work could wait. <laughs> Fair enough. And last one, um, are you editing on the phone itself? Yes. Um, so I use Snapseed. That's the, my, the app I feel most comfortable with. I use Adobe Lightroom and uh, other ones as well, but I always come back to Snapseed. I don't know why. It's really, it's just a comfort thing. I'm not great at change <laughs> normally. So once I've become comfortable with it, I'm, I'm happy to stick with it. Um, but, yeah, all, all on a mobile. Um, I will take them into, you know, uh, Lightroom or Photoshop uh, if I'm trying to prepare it for, for something. But the editing you see, particularly the ones that I put on Instagram, all, all come straight through. Awesome. Thanks, Kim. No worries.
Um, so, so now I'm going to talk through some other images and I've posted these on Instagram. I think I've posted all of them. Um, and but I've never sort of put them together as a series. I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. And I haven't really scripted how I'm going to talk about this. So this will be interesting. <laughs> um, so there's a bit of a story to this. Um, so last year in August, uh, in the middle of our hard lockdown, I had a phone call from my mother and she rang me to tell me not some bad news and bad news about her health. So I sort of paced up and down the hallways until December um, when Queensland finally opened the borders to Victoria and it meant that I could fly up, up to her and I was flying up to her to be her carer. Um, Mum got diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, it was all through her body. Um, they were doing chemo to kind of buy her some time, but it was it was not curable. So I went up to look after her um, and be her carer and help my dad, who's, you know, he's not a spring chicken um, and he has his own health problems. So they, they really needed some assistance. So I flew up there in December and I flew up there knowing kind of what I was getting myself into. Um, I knew medically what I was getting myself into. I knew physically what I would have to do because I've been a carer um, before uh, for family. Um, and emotionally, I had some idea, kind of, as much as you can in that situation. Um, but it was really unique because I was travelling during a pandemic. Um, the airport's were terrifyingly ghost-like. Um, you know, the whole process of flying in a pandemic is quite stressful, um, excuse me, and I did it quite a lot. So I would fly up for a month or six weeks and then fly home to see, see my kids, keep everything going here and then fly back again and do the whole process. And it, it went for a lot longer than uh, we first anticipated because my mum is stubborn and refuses to go down with a, without a fight. But what I found was... The, the whole thing was about weight. You know, when someone is in that position, you kind of, you go into a waiting bay, really. Your life becomes about this one event that is going to happen uh, soon. Um, and there's a weight in terms of the atmosphere. You know, your days are full of love and laughter in this process, and they really were. But there is this reality that sort of sits at the back of every conversation. Um, and sometimes you talk about it and sometimes you don't, but it's always there. So I decided when I went that I was going to take photographs through this period of time and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I still really don't know. There will be something, but I just don't know exactly what yet. Um, uh, and I've been pretty particular about how I photographed it. So I haven't photographed my mother's face, and this is my mum, my beautiful mother, um, because I don't think you need to see her face. And I know she doesn't want to be known as the cancer lady. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of labels that come with you when you're going through cancer treatments, and she didn't. She hated it. She's like, I'm just a person. So I've chosen not to show her face. Um, and the commuter series has really helped me work on this and take these photos and having the guts to take these photos, to be quite honest. I noticed little things that I normally wouldn't have noticed and that's because of the commuter series. Um, you know, there's tablets everywhere when you care for somebody and I mean everywhere. Your life is about tablets. It's about talking to doctors and getting new prescriptions and getting them filled and, and when you get them filled, it has to go through four people to sign off because of what they are. Um, and you know, administering tablets. And it's the same for the person that's going through cancer. So although I thought this this is kind of about my mum, it's more about the perception of a carer and the perception of the things that I saw as her carer. And using, you know, strength of shadows um, and lines to try and communicate that. I spent a lot of time cooking and I'm a terrible cook. I am very blessed that I have a partner that's amazing at cooking. So I generally don't cook, I clean up. But um, I did have to take over that role. I spent a lot of time staring at this stove. Um, so it was another moment of uh, where you get that, because you're busy doing something, you kind of get that sense of relief. But the whole time, because you're thinking about nutrition and what are we going to have and is this going to be enough and can people get it into them and that sort of thing, there's that weight 
to it and there's the weight of the evenings um and this is my parents lounge room and i love this photo and i love because it's enclosed by darkness um and this is what it looks like every night my father has that light on every night i i'm i'm sh <laughs> i got him to get an electrician to look at it because it's so old and so worried about it but yeah it, it's on all the time and this is that nest of of darkness of anticipation and of worry that really does fall down on on a, on a house of an evening whereas things you know to you know we get to the end of the day and things sort of quieten down but we all cope in our own ways and this is i consider a portrait of my father and i know you can hardly see my father in this photo but um dad's never happy unless he's tinkering and his way of coping is to make things that will help for now so you know modifying wheelchairs so that um mum didn't have to do it that he could do it for her and and things like that and watching over that as a carer you know as a carer you not only are watching over the person who needs the immediate assistance but you're also helping those people that are surrounded by that and this photo for me is um my favorite photo because it will constantly remind me of of that time and i know i'm talking about a really depressing subject like it's not great right sorry to bring the mood down to everybody um but we should i learned really quickly that we're terrible at talking about death and it is a natural thing and it is okay and it's okay to look after someone with cancer and it doesn't have to be sad but this is this photo for me isn't sad but it tells the story of what's what where we're at and where we're going and where we're at in that race you know this was taken at the time when her chemo was coming to a close she couldn't her body couldn't take any more and she's halfway to a bedroom and I used to watch her every night walked up the hall because she was quite unsteady in her feet um so this was another day down we got through another day and we still have light you know getting us through so for me, this sort of encapsulate, encapsulates that story and it's uh, the repetition of the lines of the fabric and the folds of her fabric. And, you know, you can't see her face, but, you know, you, you can clearly see that she's lost her hair. So, you, you know, that tells the story in itself. Um, and that tension follows periods that can get quite dark. You know, sleeping is a, an intense... Um, experience which seems like a really odd thing to say but if anyone's done it I kind of know so sleeping is like blissful time you like you know that everybody's comfortable and everyone can sort of get some things done and, and relax a bit but it's also as you progress um with the tablets that people are on you do need to be careful about what they've taken and stuff so there's always a bit of attention on that I do love the fact you can just see mum's foot um so you know someone's in the bed but you get this and you get this comfortable texture of the fabric but it also the darkness and the shadows of it give it the weight that you know this scenario as you know because i've explained what's going on and my sister and i spent a lot of time outside in the darkness talking and i love this photo for that because this really was the two of us trying to have whispered conversations without anybody knowing um but again using that darkness and you know um the, the strength of the shadows and a line to try and um communicate the pressure or the the stress that was sort of under at that time and we all say the words that you need to say and you say them pretty quickly when you get in that position and you know we should say them anyway but you tend to take them 10 times and you kind of get to the point where you've said all the words like the words are done you you were like all over that as soon as it's happening you're like Oh, blah, 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 blah. oh, you know, all the feelings come out and you make sure everything is where it needs to be because you don't know what each day is going to bring. Um, and I didn't know how to photograph that, but my nephew wrote this letter to my mum and I just photographed that I love you because that's all that needed to be said. Um, at the end of the day, that's what got my mum through this whole process um, and got me through it and my family through it. And uh it was the only way that I could sort of express that and as you kind of get towards the end things get a bit lighter you know there's still the darkness there's still shadows um and this photo for me is about that story of of becoming a bit lighter now we're coming to the end of the journey for my mum 
but it is and situations have changed she's moved into a hospice and if ever anybody ever gets into this position where they've got to do that I, I just like to say I tell this to everybody now is a hospice is your friend those people are absolutely totally amazing um and made such a difference to our experience um so the light of uh, the hospice is they're just so caring so although we were you know now in a hospital bed it was easier it was lighter and it was more comfortable for everybody and you get those moments then where you can just have the the texture and the feeling of of being there for one another and um i really do love the fact that the you can see my mum's um hospital band that you can the the beds that she had and the fabric that were on those beds are really comforting and really cozy so it's it's using that and the lines of that when i took that photo and this is the final photo and this is the moment that the funeral parlor pulled aside the curtains to show me my mum which I promised I would do only because my mum because she lost her hair she had a wig and I hated the wig my whole family hated the wig like the wig, wig was hideous but the, <laughs> she loved it but she only bought it because she wanted to be buried in it because she wanted to look good in it and I'm like okay so I had to make sure the wig looked really good which it did but again this is a coffin but it's filled with light and it the the curtains are light and it was a celebration and yeah it's finality and it's one of the hardest things you ever have to do in your life is say goodbye to someone but um the the process is normal and natural and um should be embraced um because you do really sort of you learn a lot from it i learned a hell of a lot from it um and these photos are really kind of an extension of commuter in a different way. It's trying to uh, attach the same principles of and lessons that I learned around that work and apply it to another another genre. Um, so I think all I really, the other thing I want to say is that I think when um, you go into a project and you start to think about the things that you want to get out of it, I think try to have little expectation let it take you where it will take you because it does it'll take you on a pathway that you don't think um you're going to go on and you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable uh that it's okay to get things wrong in fact it's a great thing the more bad photos that you take the more good photos you take you learn from them you should fail fast fail hard and embrace the failures because they give you the positive and the the newer images um and no matter what your work is destined to be whether it's an exhibition or a book or published or unpublished the reality is that we all take the photos because they're important to us and that gives us some fulfillment and it's easy to get lose sight of that um and the weight series and what we went through as a family and um has really allowed me to now go back and look at my computer photos and go you know what I'm not going to bag every single thing on each photo I'm actually going to look for the things that I like about it and it's it's let me finally get to the point where I know I have a good body of work now so I will always take commuter photos but now I'm ready to take that next step of working out what to do with it and I will I'm going to self-publish a book on the street uh, the commuter photos um i'm culling at the moment i culled it down to the number of photos i think i need and then i found a stack more didn't i so um we'll go through some more culling but i'm looking forward to finally being able to tell the story that i've been watching for the last year wow kim wow that's all i get to say wow the um the dignity of that white series is just wow thank so, you um, one of the questions from Sally is she asked for that weight series. Did you shoot that on your phone as well? Yeah, I did actually. Um, most of them. I have got some photos I took with another camera, but it was just one of those scenarios that they, when those moments came up, that was what I had um, on me. My camera's in the other room. 
you know, I did a lot of shooting of other things during that time. Like I went purposely out to take photos to to have my own headspace and a, a breathing moment. Um, but yeah, the the ones that were just because it was going on in the house, I could take the photos and and my mum's eyesight's bad, so I could take photos. She had no idea. <laughs> So Sue says, thanks so much, Kim, and um, she's looking forward to your book, and I think that we all are very much looking forward to it. Please let us know when um, there's good news around that. Yes, I will. Thank you. Well, um, a few other, some wonderful comments here. Jerry um, just says, beautiful. Maria, um, the photo of the shadows in the backyard with your sister, she just thought was epic. Uh, so photo. Um, Ushi, such poignant dignity um, to the images and all that there on it. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll give anyone else the opportunity to ask some questions and um, we'll hand over to Russ. You're on mute, Russ. I'm, I'm not good at this, am I? All right. <laughs> I was just going to say, wow, and congratulations, Kim, on amassing such a great portfolio of fantastic images. Um, it's it's always great to hear how photographers go about their craft, but uh, tonight was just a great insight and in how you go about it, and probably more importantly, your feelings behind the photos. So, um, fantastic! Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I have a photo. Oh, sorry, I have a question about one of your photos. Um, I don't know. Uh, it was one of the introduction photos, the one with the number five on the fence. Oh yes. Cloud. I want to ask what you saw in that photo to take that photo because I saw something in that photo. And I don't know if you've seen it, but um, what, what was the what was the what was the thought behind that? Yeah, so that photo um, it's actually taken at my parents' house. It's it's the fence um, on their unit. They're in a, a unit at the back of their house, and there's like all these parking spots. And there was this big number five. And Toowoomba has the most amazing weather in um, storms that we come through um, because I was there for summer, so. Um, I used to always go out to watch the thunderstorms come in. Um, Dad and I used to actually go and photograph them in the middle of the night um, when I was young, so I've always always loved them. But I took it because I love the, the structural nature of that cloud. But when I started editing, I saw a face in the cloud. Yeah. Is that That's what you can see? Saw a dog's, I saw a dog's face in the yeah. cloud. So when I saw that, I, I, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. But, um, yeah, that's, that's great, great seeing that. I love that. So, Kim, have you shared your work with your dad and what's he think of it? Um, my dad thinks I'm brilliant. Like, he's a good dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm the best in the world, according to my father. I've even, my father even called the local paper one day because I, <laughs> I had a photo that actually got exhibited at the Louvre. It was part of a see me exhibition. It wasn't open to the public. It was just behind closed doors. And so it sounds far more exciting than what it actually physically was. But my dad dragged his rear end down a local paper and he's like, my daughter, <laughs> you will put a thing in the paper about her. Um, and so my dad's really supportive. He's seen some of the weight series. He hasn't seen all of it. Um, and I did take a photo of him and my mother one day and uh, it was on Christmas Day and they were talking to my brother and his kids on the on a computer because my brother lives in America, so obviously he couldn't be here. Um, and I showed my dad about a week later and he burst into tears and said, thank you so much for taking it. Um, so he was glad and he knew I took photos of mum the whole time. And some, to be honest, some of those photos were because we were having trouble keeping track of things with mum. So the easiest way for my sister and I to communicate was by taking photos and going, do you reckon, can you see, like, am I losing it? Um, so my dad knew I was doing that and he was always very appreciative. So I'm looking forward to the day that I can give him the weight series. My dad is doing really well and he's really, he's, he's gotten through this process a lot, I think better than everybody else, to be honest. Um, because he had a lot of time to process before anything happened. Um, so I, it's at the point where I have to be comfortable with it um, and I have to process everything that I went through. You know, the photography really helped with it, that. But, you know, coming back to your family and a bit of a reality check, you need some time to, to really grieve. So I'm looking forward to the day where I can give him 
something tangible for him to look back on and i i know he'll love it he'll he'll cry but he'll love it absolutely why so um laurie just says thank you so much for letting us in kim beautiful photos of your mum and the mood surrounding her yeah i think thank we all agree with that Um, well, thanks everyone. Thanks for your questions. Um, I'm glad that you found something interesting in there. I was really worried I was going to bore everyone because I'm talking about train photos. <laughs> but um, I really enjoyed it. And to be honest, I learned a lot from doing this as well. It's the first time I've really had to present what I think about my work. So um, it was good timing. I think it was uh, meant to happen now where I had the opportunity to really sort of look at it. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kim. And on behalf of the ASPE members, I'd like to thank you for your time and excellent presentation. So, congrats. Um, okay, we'll just finish up then. Uh, we can check out the ASPE YouTube channel for the past episodes of the speaker series. That's easy ac access via our website, aspe.com.au. And also, if you have any questions for us or any ideas for the ASPE team, contact us via our contact page on our website. Uh, just to finish up, I'll say the speaker series will continue next month with Marcus Anderson, our guest speaker. So that's 8 p.m. Uh, the 12th of October. So uh, keep your eye on the inbox, the Google Meets link to that. And we might even have something else coming your way. We don't know. We'll Because uh, we're still in lockdown, we'll see if we can get something else happening as well. But um, thank you all for joining us. And hopefully we can get to go out in the streets in the not too distant future. So thanks, everyone. Stay safe and uh, good night. Hang around if you like Kim. <laughs> <laughs>